Welcome everybody to day four, no, day five. Welcome to day five. Great to see all your faces. I hope you're doing well, as well as can be expected during the middle of a retreat and during the middle of this time period that we're in. It's an interesting time to be on retreat. And that's, that's putting it really mildly. So today I, I want to speak about the two truths of being human. And the, the notion of two truths is a, it's a Buddhist concept. It arose during around the second century CE in India. It's, a lot of this is attributed to a kind of almost mythical monk character named Nagarjuna. And Nagarjuna was a Buddhist monk who had been practicing with, obviously practicing and working with the early Buddhist teachings, which were at that point several hundred years old, although only recently put down into text. And Nagarjuna, from, from the historical perspective of later Buddhist traditions, is said to have really created quite a revolution in Buddhist thought by offering this notion of the two truths, along with a couple other things, including a reinterpretation of what interdependence and emptiness mean. So Nagarjuna in the second century, he, he did something kind of radical, which was he said, up to this point, the goal of the Buddhist path has really been to escape samsara, the cyclical existence of continual rebirth, suffering, death, rebirth, suffering, death, <laughs> this constant uh, process, which is how the early Indian tradition understood um, that was their metaphysics. And he said, you know, actually the goal isn't just to get out of samsara and into nirvana, you know, into this, this empty void that is, um, that is what the Buddha called the unborn uh, or the undying. Um, he said, actually, we, we need to look at both of these two as true. It's not that samsara is an illusion and that nirvana is the ultimate truth. It's that nirvana is actually a kind of ultimate truth, but it's one that doesn't negate the particularities of our life that we actually can look at both of these as being true. There's a couple different ways of talking about the two truths. Um, some folks use the phrase, um, the absolute to describe one of the two truths and the relative. So you have the absolute truth and the relative truth or the ultimate truth and the relative truth. You also in Zen, you find the essential truth and the contingent truth. Here, for the purposes of this talk, you could say you have the, the truth of being and the truth of human. We have the being truth and the human truth. We're both being and we're both human. Or as my teachers, Jack Kornfield and Trudy Goodman would of, often say, we have the universal truth and the personal truth. Or as Jack once said, you've got to remember both your Buddha nature and your zip code. Buddha nature being the ultimate truth, you know, the, 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 tr the true truth about our ultimate beingness and our zip code being all the specific details of life that we also need to remember. <laughs> Otherwise we won't be being human for much, for long. <laughs> if we stop taking care of things, uh, ultimately we stop existing. Or as Lisa Sherman once said, you know, for, for beings, even the uh, simplest forms of beings, if they didn't move, they were someone else's lunch. So built into existence is this uh, need, this necessity to move, to seek, to strive for survival, actually. And that's part of why these, these both of these things are true, because we're born as a, as a, as a being. Uh, and we have all of the sort of conditioning that we're born into. And it's not just human conditioning. I think really to understand these two truths of the universal and the personal, it's helpful to go all the way back to the beginning of what we call the universe. 
you know, ultimately this is where the conditioning arises from. So our best story at the moment, and I think it is a story, I'm sure it'll change. <laughs> uh, our best story at the moment is that the universe began in temporal terms 13.7 billion years ago with a big bang. Out of the void, whatever that was, because there was no space or time prior to this, uh, everything emerged and quickly uh, and hotly. <laughs> and uh, eventually that quick hot explosion of space time matter um, started to congeal and to form into clumps and to become a kind of universal network. Out of that form early formation of the universe, eventually our, our own sun and eventually our own earth some 4.5 billion years ago started to uh, come into being. And interesting, not long after, in relative terms, the earth formed, the first life actually emerges some 3.75 billion years ago. It's almost as if life wants to emerge. Fast forward again, another maybe two and a half billion years ago or so, um, bacteria arrives on the scene that's able to photosynthesize. So the first being on earth who can take the energy of the sun and convert it into energy and output oxygen. And that ends up creating the environment, the conditions that, that we habitate in now, you know, this oxygenated environment, totally different chemistry before these beings emerged. And of course, what's interesting is when that happened, it wasn't just like this great uh, birth of new life. It was actually a great death initially. Uh, during this time, it's considered the great dying. Uh, some 96% of species on earth actually perished because they, they, weren't, they weren't able to survive in a highly oxygenated environment. So the history of Earth is, it's not just this linear progressive history that we're sometimes taught. It's actually more like a spiral with these great explosions of diversity and then these great, uh, these great deaths. There've been at least, so far as we know, at least five ex major extinction events in the history of the Earth. About six to 900 million years ago, multicellular life emerges. So we, we arrive, we arise from single cells and then the single cells become more complex and they start to form multicellular organisms, a, a huge leap in life. Some 470 million years ago, the first land plants um, start to evolve and show up on the scene. And now 55 million years later, the first primates are uh, our real kind of uh, ancestors in some ways start to emerge. And then even more uh, recent ancestors, the hominids arrived 6 million years ago. And modern humans, the homo sapiens, we've only really hit the scene in the last few hundred thousand years, 300,000 years ago, uh, modern humans arise. You know, here we are 300,000 years old and we think we've been here forever. <laughs> of course. Um, 200,000 years or so ago, we figure out how to do the language thing. We start to like, our grunts start to form into something more complex and we start to actually understand concepts and symbols and communicate in, in more complex ways. And then we have definitive proof from some cave uh, paintings. I think it's in Serbia, uh, the first proof of shamanism emerging in human culture some 30,000 years ago. It's probably older than that. That's just, we know for sure it's at least 30,000 years old. And I found out while doing a little research that in fact, the word shaman derives from uh, an earlier uh, word that means one who knows. And that was kind of shocking to me because one of my teachers, Jack Kornfield, his teacher, Ajahn Chah, often spoke about the one who knows. He said uh, that the term Budo is the one who knows. So in a way, Buddhism itself, of course, is rooted in this deeper indigenous spiritual uh, globe, you know, global because it emerged, it seems to, to have emerged everywhere. Everywhere there were humans, we were, we were doing things to communicate with the unseen world. We started to form a relationship with life that was more kind of magical and abstract and started to really open up our human spirituality. We started to experiment with different plants 
uh, to see their healing properties, some of them entheogenic. Um, there's some theories that suggest that perhaps our evolution is uh, tied up with um, also some of these interesting entheogenic substances, um, though that's fairly speculative. Um, and then 10,000 years ago, we stop uh, primarily being hunters and gatherers, which has been what we've been doing mostly up to that point. And we start to develop at large scale agriculture and cities and empires. We start to coalesce and centralize and uh, suddenly we start to get into big cities and share viruses and do things that prior to that probably, you know, now we're in the age of the pandemic because we live in a, in a, in a human society where there's so much grouping together of humans. And we became sedentary for the first time too. Flash, flash, uh, flash forward a little bit, 2,500 or so years ago, between three and eight BCE, you have what Carl Jaspers, the German philosopher called the Axial Age, suddenly and simultaneously across the world, in the West, in India, in China, you see the development of some of the world's great religions and spiritual traditions. You see Lao Tzu and Confucius in China, Zarathustra in Iran. You see the Buddha and the Upanishads are developed in India. You have Plato and Socrates coming out of Greece. You have the, uh, the Judeo-Christian prophets emerging in Palestine. All of this is simultaneously happening within a few hundred years. And Carl Jaspers argued that during the Axial Age, the spiritual foundations of humanity were laid simultaneously and independently in China, India, Persia, Judea, and Greece. And these, he says, are the foundations of which, upon which humanity still subsists today. Then of course, we know, we know this history 300 years ago uh, in Europe, the Western Enlightenment occurs. Good news, bad news. Um, a whole host of interesting uh, theories are developed uh, for the first time ever in uh, around the world, eventually slavery is officially outlawed, although it still continues to happen um, uh, unofficially. And uh, some beautiful ideals about universal humanism are unleashed. And of course, we, we struggle for the next few hundred years to realize them um, and are still struggling to do so. And of course, in the modern age, so much has changed. This is the age in some ways that we, uh, I would say, are emerging out of. Um, to me, because we talk so much about the modern age, that's a sign that we're not in it anymore. It's very hard to see something when you're in it. So I think we've emerged into something different. And perhaps in the last 25 years, one of the biggest catalysts for that has been the development of the internet, of this hyper-connected network that simultaneously connects us together across space-time, uh, the emergence of what the uh, uh, Tehard de Chardin, the um, priest called the noosphere, you know, this layer of mind that exists atop the biosphere. And of course, the problem with modernity is that we've uh, gotten too much into the noosphere and have sort of forgotten our roots, right? But here I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this brief history of the unfolding of the universe because it's important if we're going to talk about the, the universe and the personal to understand, you know, where did this person arise from? Like we didn't just appear when we were born, uh, although our personal consciousness seems to have appeared during birth. Uh, all the conditions that we've inherited as an individual and uh, comes out of this long history this 13.7 billion years of evolution, uh, right up to this moment. Uh, we are the cutting edge of evolution unfolding right now. And that's, um, you know, both an exciting thought and I think a very scary thought. <laughs> oh. And we may not be the cutting edge forever. Evolution doesn't care about us. As uh, John Verveke says, evolution is revolution with change. So we've got this kind of constant cycling, these constant processes moving. And when there's change, there's evolution. So here we are, our, again, our best stories that we're evolving. And, uh, and, 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 and yet we, we have this amazing, um, to me, we have this 
amazing conceptual framework we can pull from to understand both how it can be that we have access to this prime, this aspect of human experience, which is primordial. It, that is, it exists prior to the arising of space and time. Or you could say, uh, using a sort of Zen koan, which normally said, show me your original face before your parents were born. You could, we could change that and say, show me your original face before the Big Bang. Who were you before the Big Bang? This is pointing directly toward that, that aspect of, uh, of the two truths, the ultimate truth, the, the, the formless, inexpressible truth of being. One of my mentors, Ken Wilber, uh, writes about this, this way, this beingness, and also about the way that that beingness is not separate from everything that's arising. In a book called Quantum Questions, he writes, on the one hand, Spirit is the highest of all possible domains. It is the summit of all realms, the being beyond all beings. It is a domain that is a subset of no other domain and thus preserves its radically transcendental nature. On the other hand, since spirit is all pervading and all inclusive, since it's the set of all possible sets, the condition of all conditions and the nature of all natures. It's not properly thought of as a realm set apart from other realms, but as the ground of being of all realms, the pure that of which manifestation is but a play or modification. And thus spirit preserves paradoxically its radically imminent nature. So this two truths, they are not separate from one another. It's a distinction that we can make to look at experience, to look at the different dimensionality of our experience, that we have the zero dimension, the void, zero, that the actual number was invented in India, and it literally is sunyata, which is also the same word that's used for emptiness. So we have the zero dimension. Um, and then we have all of the numbers. We have all of the things, all the particulars. And these are both true. They're actually non-dual. Um, as Francis shared in his um, beautiful quote, form is emptiness. Emptiness is form from the Heart Sutra. That's also, uh, that same text arises during the same uh, revolution in Buddhist thought during uh, the, the second turning of the Mahayana school. Ken Wilber had another way of talking about it. He said, you know, uh, these two truths in a way point to on the one side, how we transcend our limited identifications. And that's part of what we've been doing during the first half of this retreat. We've been working on seeing clearly what's arising moment to moment, the six senses, body sensations, mind states, thoughts. We've been turning them into an object. We've been seeing them, knowing them, and thus becoming free of identification with them. Um, we simply are seeing everything that's arising as that. Again, that which is arising, which is great. You know, that's beautiful. I think it's, uh, it's, really, it's really awesome to, to to discover that transcendental truth because there's a certain kind of freedom in it that um, is, is totally liberating. But uh, as Wilbur says, we also, we transcend and we include, we transcend and include two truths. So while it's true that we can wake up and, and that's what I think many of us are here doing, it's also true that we need to wake down um, once we wake up, we have to begin the process of waking down because as, as Wilbur pointed out, the ground of being, the ultimate ground of being is not separate from that which is arising. If we think it's separate, we've created another duality. Non-duality, the truth of non-duality stretches us beyond our, our tendency to take this 
recent development of language and to categorize and split the world up in these dualistic terms, which apparently is pretty interesting development in terms of evolution, but it also creates us a huge amount of suffering. <laughs> so we've inherited this incredibly amazing organism, which can parse everything apart and clearly see threats and is constantly hyper vigilant about survival. And, and, and in a way I say, great, because we're still alive, you know, we're here, we can have this conversation. Um, but also not great because, um, because especially in the modern postmodern condition, uh, a lot of that is actually not as useful. Um, it's like not so useful when you're on Twitter, you know, and suddenly someone says something and it like, <laughs> and you suddenly feel like you have to get ready to go into physical battle. You know? <laughs> it's like, uh, okay, uh, perhaps our evolution and, and, and the context in which we evolved is, is different. Um, from the context in which we are now. And that, that's kind of how I think about the awakening traditions is that in a way we're taking evolution into our own hands. You know, we're trying to, um, trying to really adapt to this current situation. And what's so crazy to me too, is like, even if one has a very deep and profound understanding of the non-duality of emptiness and form, or being human, um, even if we get both of those sides of our being human, we still it doesn't mean that all of a sudden all of our un, um, all of our conditioning goes away. Uh, in fact, the only thing that I found really changes is that we become aware of our conditioning. Or as uh, again, Ken Wilber said, uh, it hurts more and bothers us less as we wake up, you know, because we're actually tuning in, we're becoming more sensitized um, because we're not trying to escape this experience when we have discovered the being, which is always already present. When we really can learn how to just rest in this moment, even if it sucks, then we really are clearly seeing what's here. And I'm sure many of you have been noticing that increased sensitivity, which hurts more first. And then as we're with it, as we can work with it, it starts to bother us less. We start to develop equanimity. But what's interesting is that process doesn't stop from what I can tell. Like even for folks who, who have total confidence in their, in their nature, and who they are, they can just be, you know, even for people that know how to be, <laughs> uh, they still have to deal with the particularities of their conditioning and their life. We all do. Where, where this has become really real for me uh, in recent years is looking at racial conditioning. And I think this is one of those areas where we've just got a lot of work to do especially in predominantly white communities to really examine and look at how our experience of identity, particularly our racial identity uh, is conditioning how we are in the world. Ruth King in her book, Mindful of Race, she writes, much of who we are, including our appearance, skin color, gestures, talents, habits, beliefs, and actions, as well as our relationship to our own race and to other races is inherited from our parents and ancestors and is without examination passed on to the next generation. So for me, I've, I think in some ways had the great fortune having grown up in a biracial family and in, in a white Arabic family to realize uh, some of the truth of this early on to see clearly, oh, there are these different identities that are possible. People are not all the same. In fact, even within my own family of these radically different cultures, oh, wow, there's a lot of diversity here. And, and part of what I realized uh, kind of growing up um, with, a, with one half of my family being Palestinian and having had uh, really experienced a great trauma, great cultural trauma, of um, what I later learned was probably most accurately called ethnic cleansing, 
with, uh, you know, definitely some also genocide mixed in. That this trauma is something that actually I learned only in the last 10 or so years that I continue to carry in my own body. And it was only through doing this work of awakening and doing psychotherapeutic work and really trying to understand, you know, the nature of my own suffering and the nature of my own delusions did I come to start to understand that most of what I'm deluded about isn't my, isn't actually my fault. Um, it's actually something I inherited. It's actually, I didn't, I can't even remember, you know, these events, these things, but they're there in the body, the body, uh, as someone earlier mentioned, the body keeps the score. Vassal Vondercook's amazing book about this. Today, I released a podcast on Buddhist geeks with a, with a fellow named Greg Thomas. And Greg is, um, he's a scholar, he's an educator. He uh, runs a project called the Jazz Leadership um, Initiative. And I met him while doing uh, a, a weekend workshop with Diane Musho Hamilton that um, Francis was kind enough to gift to me. And um, I ended up sitting down and talking to him about his work and his experience being a black man in America and being a, being a black man in the integral uh, community and Buddhist communities really being in in some very white communities, I'm like, how, you know, what, you know, how do you do that? Because you're such a bridge builder, and uh, we talked about that on the podcast. And I wanted to share this quote um, from him because it really speaks to me, also to the two truths. Um, and our whole conversation really uh, is about the two truths and about how to look at race from the perspective of non-duality. He says, "There's a truth to the fact that we are all one." and that we share in the ineffability of the source of the fullness of emptiness. And all these things that signify, because we're using human language, that our origins, our source, from and through which all things come and flow and towards which we're moving. But in between time, on this human level, in this particular incarnation, we have to deal with the reality of materiality and the material plane that we're on. The materiality itself is going to bring suffering. Duality will do that. Non-duality is oneness. We have to navigate skillfully using skillful means. And that's where we get to wisdom. Wisdom, he said, allows us to be able to play with these dualities. Again, you see play is a reference back to the jazz perspective. Wisdom takes into consideration I, we, and it. It takes into consideration the dual and the non-dual. It takes into consideration the reality of oneness and the particularity of the many. So I'd strongly encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to check out that conversation. Um, it's very interesting to hear someone who has such a deep well of freedom in their own being and who's really worked in this space and who's able to build bridges with communities that are unlike his own to speak with such depth uh, about the, the possibility for liberation and the reality that we're far from there. You know, and for me, I think for many years, I thought that this, that this kind of critique of whiteness that I was somehow beyond that because I wasn't just white. You know, I grew up in a partially Palestinian family. I saw relatives who were oppressed. I like, I kind of, I feel like, yeah, I kind of know a bit about what's going on here. So I don't feel like I participate in exactly this way. But part of what I've realized actually in recent years is that I have participated uh, in these in these unconscious ways with this unconscious conditioning in part because it's the water we swim in even my Palestinian grandfathers, 87 years old, even my mom who was born in Kuwait, you know, even my family members who are Arabic living in the United States, all of them have also taken on this conditioning. We all swim in it, it's, it's the water we swim in. And part of what happens like in this specific instance, part of what I found useful is to see the way that when we take on delusions which exist in culture, we use those delusions to oppress ourselves, to prevent the own 
to prevent ourselves from getting in touch with the richness of our own ancestry, to see actually the deep wisdom that we can get in touch with that could actually help us navigate these times. And so for me, I, I wanted to mention this particular form of conditioning uh, in part because it's so uncomfortable to talk about. Uh, it's so difficult to talk about, especially for white people. You know, we have, I think in general, we have a hard time discussing these things. Not everyone in the same way, but, um, but awakening doesn't mean that we transcend our delusions. It just means we, we realize we're not only that. And yet we still have to engage with our delusions. We still have to look at the ways in which we continue to be deluded, unconscious, and continue to live in ways that cause suffering in the world. To me, that's also part of this, uh, this, this vision of wisdom that Nagarjuna laid out and that Greg is talking about, this ability to respond to life, to actually see what's happening here to move in and out of oneness and manyness, to not get stuck in oneness, in a fake kind of oneness. And to realize the oneness isn't something we can ever pin down. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Or as Ken Wilber once said, form is emptiness, emptiness is evolving because we know that the world of form is evolving now. So here uh, we'll continue our exploration in small groups. And I'd like to invite you to just kind of reflect a bit on where you are in your own process of relating to the non-duality of the universal and the personal. Like, do you feel like you have some grounding in the universal or do you feel like that's kind of what you're deepening into right now? If so, you could share a bit about that. Um, or do you feel that you have some sense of what th this non-duality is and that you're trying to kind of work with that? You know, where, where do you see your own path? Where are your current edges? Uh, and, and um, you know, let's just share a little bit about how we relate to these two truths.